thank you, Ron. Um, thank you for inviting me out here. Uh, Ron was kind enough to uh, not only pick me up from the airport this morning, but show me around your, your beautiful community. It really is, uh, you're all very fortunate to live in such a beautiful place. Well, today I'm going to be talking about uh, an area that's a lot different from, from Oregon, uh, Antarctica. Um, and uh, I think I'll start off with just getting right to one of the questions that I always get. Why, why do we go to such great expense and, and big uh, hassle uh, to work um, in Antarctica, considering how difficult it is? Because um, when we work in Antarctica, the winter temperatures are as low as uh, minus 80 C, which is about uh, minus 110 Fahrenheit. Um, there's six months of darkness, uh, and most of the year there's no way we can get to our equipment. So, for example, all in the first, uh, you know, t several decades of my career, we couldn't even work in Antarctica because doing the kind of work that I do, because we couldn't make the equipment work there. So why don't we just gather seismic data where it's uh, more, much more easy to do uh, in places like Oregon here, um, and uh, uh, and study that. And of course, many, many seismologists do. But today I'm going to talk about some of the unique problems, the unique things that we can learn by studying uh, Antarctica, and particularly by, by using geophysics and using seismology uh, in Antarctica. And when we think about Antarctica and, and the unique uh, aspects of Antarctica, we think immediately about the ice sheet. Um, and when I think about ice sheets, I don't immediately think about uh, the Midwest or the North America, but it's sort of incredible when you really think about it that only an instant in geologic time, about 15,000 years ago, um, places like Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, Detroit, uh, Cleveland were covered up by uh, a mile of ice, okay? And when I fly over Antarctica and I look down and I see that tremendous ice sheet, I have to remember that that's the way a lot of North America looked only an instant ago uh, in geologic time. Um, and this map shows how uh, over the, you know, over about 10,000 years time, uh, the North American ice sheet uh, really disappeared. Um, the, the numbers there refer to the time period in thousands of years when that was the edge of the ice sheet. So you can see that 21,000 years ago was sort of the maximum, and then the ice sheet melted back until about uh, 7,000 years ago, the remnants of that ice sheet finally disappeared. Um, and so why does that matter to a place like Oregon? Um, well, if, if we look at the global sea, the sea level curve uh, over the last 21,000 years, uh, you see that as this ice sheet melted back, uh, the sea level rose uh, by almost 400 feet. Um, and that's because all of this ice that, that melted went into the oceans. And of course, as you're adding water to the oceans, then the sea level rises. Um, so there's an uh, intimate link between what's happening to the ice sheets uh, and what happens to, to sea level uh, in uh, affecting coastlines all around, uh, all around the world. Um, so now getting to Antarctica, uh, when we think about the Antarctic ice sheet, this is a map of Antarctica and it shows uh, the Antarctic ice sheet. We usually think of Antarctica as, as essentially having two parts. Uh, we call it East Antarctica and West Antarctica. So people ask me, what do you mean by East Antarctica and West Antarctica? When you're in the South Pole, you know, all the directions are north, right? So, so what's East and what's West, which can get quite confusing. Uh, when you're near the South Pole and somebody says something about east or west, um, it can be very, very confusing. But East Antarctica is that part of Antarctica that's along east longitude. Uh, and West Antarctica is that part of Antarctica that's along west uh, longitudes. Um, and so people have done uh, modeling. This is some uh, modeling of the Antarctic ice sheet uh, over a period uh, of thousands of years as the Earth goes between a, what we call a glacial epi episode and an interglacial. Um, and uh, I'll just try to play this movie a little bit. Um, and you can see what happens as time goes on uh, to the Antarctic ice sheet. So the East Antarctic ice sheet is pretty stable. 
But look at what happens to the West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, it basically goes away during the interglacials or during the warmest periods uh, of Earth history. Um, and then uh, it comes back uh, as the Earth's climate uh, gets colder. So basically, this part of the Antarctic ice sheet seems to be extremely sensitive to uh, any changes uh, in the Earth's climate. Um, and so I guess the point I'm trying to make is that one, the real reason to study Antarctica is because of the interaction between the geology and the ice sheet, um, and that the, the ice sheet is itself unstable, um, and so uh, we can expect that there, if there's changes in the Earth's environment, that it will produce dramatic uh, changes in the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, the other thing I would mention is just the small, oh, well, I shouldn't, it's not that small, but this part of the Antarctic ice sheet West Antarctica, uh, if that melts, it produces a, a rise of global sea level by about 16 feet. So just by itself, that part of the Antarctic ice, ice sheet is, is very important for, for global sea level. And um, this is just a plot uh, of global sea level records uh, going back to the year 1700. Um, and then going forward uh, as with projections, uh, uh, out to the year 2100, or about 85 years from now. Um, and so it shows that we have observed a rise of about one foot so far, um, but that modeling predicts an additional one to three feet over just the next 85 years. So, so this is something to, so the, essentially what's going on with the West Nordic Ice Sheet should, is quite relevant to us uh, here. So now I'll go back and just talk a little bit about why we do seismology in Antarctica and, and just a few basics about seismology. Um, and I know because you live in Oregon here that some of you know quite a bit about seismology because you do have a few earthquakes and you have a tremendous seismic hazard uh, along the coast uh, with a record of earthquakes in the past. But it, it's still, I'll still go back and talk a little bit about seismographs, uh, what we do in Antarctica, what, what the work involves in terms of going to Antarctica. Um, and in the three main science topics I'm going to talk about here, the first one is, is weighing the ice sheets and how seismology helps us to measure uh, the weight of the ice sheets and how that's changing. Uh, the secondly, then I'll talk a bit about volcanoes uh, that we've discovered in Antarctica. Uh, and in the heat flow into the base of the ice sheet in the last part uh, is essentially uh, thinking about ice quakes and recording uh, the ice movement with seismographs. Um, so first of all, just to give you a little background on seismology, um, this is uh, the idea of a seismograph here. Um, the very simplest uh, type of uh, device to measure the motion of the ground uh, during an earthquake was probably invented by, by the ancient Chinese. And this is uh, a, a model of the uh, seismoscope um, where uh, basically each of these little dragon heads held uh, something that looked like a ball bearing. And when the earth started to shake, then that would fall into the mouth of the, the corresponding frog and, and that would tell them the direction uh, of the of the earthquake from you know from wherever they had the seismoscope, probably Beijing or something or, or, or Nanjing or something. So the emperor could tell you know what direction the earthquake was in his empire. Um, then, kind of the concept of a seismograph is illustrated by this figure, um, and you can imagine that if you just hang uh, a weight, um, and then you imagine the earth moving side to side that weight will be moving uh, relative to the ground. And then if you can record that, um, you know, either electrically or, or in a simple way with a pen like this, uh, then you can record how the, how the Earth is moving. Uh, not perfectly, because this um, mass will also be moving, but you can certainly obtain a record uh, of, what's, uh, of the fact that there's a, you know, waves arriving in the Earth. Um, a modern seismograph doesn't look quite so, so wonderful. Uh, as the Chinese one uh, looks kind of boring like that, but it can measure really, really uh, minute motions of the Earth uh, that you can not feel at all. So that's 
why a seismograph here in Oregon would measure, you know, many earthquakes in one day uh, that you can't uh, feel with your, uh, uh, yourself. Okay, so, and then uh, the other kind of basic concept is when there's a large earthquake somewhere in the world, seismic waves go out, you know, throughout the Earth's interior. Um, and so that we can record earthquakes, you know, all the way from the other side of the world. Um, and then the pattern of those uh, different, you know, the en different energy arrivals can tell us things about the Earth's interior. Um, so that's, it's because of seismology, for example, that we know that the Earth has a solid inner core uh, discovered by Inga Lehman uh, about 80 years ago, uh, and a liquid outer core, um, and in um, the, the, the mantle. And in, we can also use seismic waves then to work out, you know, more precise uh, structures um, uh, various places in the world. And so another question that I always get about Antarctica is uh, some people have looked at global uh, earthquake maps and they say, oh, well, there aren't many big earthquakes in Antarctica, so how do you use a seismograph to, to study uh, things in Antarctica uh, without any big earthquakes there? Um, well, we are able to use earthquakes throughout the world uh, to uh, image the Earth uh, beneath the ice in Antarctica. So we essentially, this is a map uh, of the earthquakes throughout the world that we used in one of our studies. Um, and you can see we're using earthquakes from places like Japan uh, or South America or Mexico. Um, uh, you know, they're all recorded. If they're large earthquakes, they're recorded in Antarctica and we use the waves coming up through the Earth from those distant earthquakes uh, to essentially get an image or a picture of the Earth beneath uh, our, where we have our seismographs uh, installed. And uh, just to give you a general idea of some of the analysis methods that we use, I'm not going to speak very much about you know, how we analyze the data. It's a complicated procedure. Um, and it involves computers, and we have our graduate students uh, working on it. Um, but one idea that we use to get an image uh, of the Earth uh, is the idea of tomography, uh, which is a lot like medical imaging in many ways. It uses the same mathematics uh, as many types of medical imaging. And the idea is you have seismic energy coming through the, through the material at all sorts of different angles uh, from different sources and recorded at different seismographs. And if you measure the, the time that those uh, are, the, uh, waves take to go through there, or, or in other words, the average velocity along each of these paths, okay, uh, and you have many of those paths, you can mathematically reconstruct how the velocity varies uh, in, the, in the medium that you're looking at. Uh, and so, you know, you can imagine making these blocks smaller and smaller as you have many, many ray paths, and eventually you can get an image of what's there. Um, another method is to take the incoming wave from those distant earthquakes, um, and when it hits a boundary, such as the boundary between the mantle and the crust, or it could be between uh, maybe the, the deep crustal rocks and sediments, or it could be between the sediments and the ice, uh, then those waves, some of that wave energy will be converted from P waves, uh, which are pressure waves, to uh, S waves, which are shear waves. Um, and those waves travel slower and have different motions, so we can uh, look at the travel time difference between the P waves and the S waves uh, and determine that we have a boundary there. Um, okay, so this, that's enough of the background now. I'll just talk a little bit about how we do our work in Antarctica uh, and how, you know, the, what is involved actually in putting uh, seismographs uh, and seismic instruments in Antarctica. Um, and I should mention that this is work that really wasn't possible before about uh, maybe 15 years ago uh, because of advances in technology. So first of all, of course, we have to get to the field. Um, and uh, when we get a, a project approved by the U.S. Antarctic Program, then uh, we can use uh, the resources of the National Science Foundation uh, and other branches of the U.S. government to, to do our work there. So uh, in general, we fly to the field uh, in an uh, airplane like this uh, C-130, 
uh, um, Air Force uh, uh, military transport plane. Uh, only with it's not a standard version though because it has skis uh, on it instead of uh, instead of wheels. Um, and then when we uh, fly maybe from our main base to a smaller you know to the place where we deploy our seismographs, we'll fly in a small twin otter aircraft uh, here, uh, slightly larger than the one I flew this morning from Portland uh, to uh, to Coos Bay, um, uh, which also has skis on it. Um, and uh, then sometimes more and more we've been using uh, snowmobiles uh, to go even long distances across Antarctica, uh, uh, pulling our equipment. Um, and in, uh, uh, so these are really the main methods of transport that we use. Um, we have uh, had experience with some, uh, some accidents. So one of my graduate students was in this, uh, this plane crash um, so uh, we, we do remember that there are some hazards involved. Um, fortunately, everybody was okay. Uh, the airplane, uh, of course, was not okay. Uh, I was really amazed, though, how they flew in uh, 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 a number, I think three mechanics. The mechanics camped there uh, for like two months and rebuilt the aircraft uh, right in the field uh, in Antarctica. So. Uh, um, even uh, that aircraft was was saved. Um, so, and I mentioned recently we've been using uh, snowmobile traverses uh, more and more. Uh, this is uh, my graduate student uh, Andrew Lloyd uh, went on a, a about a thousand mile long uh, ski do or snowmobile traverse to deploy seismographs across a part of Antarctica. So this is a, a photo of them taking off. Uh, or getting ready to take off on that uh, on that traverse, um, they I think it's kind of funny they pull this uh, this uh, thing they call a Conestoga, which I guess is sort of like you know Oregon Trail sort of thing. But <laughs> um, and uh, it's on skis, and then they have all their cook gear on the inside, and they can um, burrow in there if there's a bad storm or something. I mean, normally they sleep in small tents, but. Uh, but if there's a bad storm, they have this, uh, this solid um, uh, um, thing along. Um, and uh, when we're doing this work uh, at these, remote, these very remote sites, uh, we live in field camps. Um, this is sort of a picture of, uh, of a field camp. We have a couple of larger tents uh, with uh, cooking uh, where we can cook or we can do computer analysis of our data. Um, and for the night, we sleep uh, in these uh, little tents. Of course, it never gets dark. We're only working there during the summertime. So uh, in the Antarctic summer, the sun is up 24 hours. Um, so you have to kind of cover your eyes up or something if you want to sleep. Uh, but um, actually, the sleeping bags are really good, though. So the only bad part is getting up in the morning, uh, especially when you have to go use the facilities. So um, in, in general, though, you get kind of used to that kind of life. and, and uh, uh, it really goes pretty well. And this is just a picture of like one of our typical field parties uh, might look with some pilots uh, and uh, uh, various scientists uh, and in some graduate students uh, along. Um, and the seismographs themselves, um, this is what uh, one of the sensors uh, maybe looks like. Uh, we just put them uh, in the snow about maybe five feet uh, deep in the snow so that the wind uh, doesn't affect them. Uh, and uh, uh, then we have insulated boxes that contain uh, batteries uh, and then the electronic gear that uh, record the signals from that sensor. Um, and uh, e one of the things that we try to do is insulate this box uh, enough so that the, the box will actually keep in uh, whatever uh, small amount of energy is given off by the electronic gear and that manages in that way we manage to keep the gear uh, at about maybe 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the surrounding uh, uh, than the surrounding snow which can be the difference between it being too cold uh, or being able to survive because you're at the very rugged raw limit of where electronics can survive uh, when you're talking about wintertime temperatures of like minus 80 Fahrenheit, minus 100 Fahrenheit. Um, and then during the summertime, of course, we can power 
these systems with, uh, with solar power because the sun is up all the time. But during the winter time, we have to use uh, batteries uh, to run the entire, uh, the entire winter. Um, well, using this kind of technology, we've been able to make uh, sort of a really order of magnitude uh, move forward uh, in uh, what we know about Antarctica um, seismically, because even just looking back 10 years ago, the, the map of seismographs in Antarctica looked like this, because we only had seismographs at uh, bases, like the South Pole base, uh, where uh, people are living year round because there had to be somebody there to take, it, you know, to take care of the seismograph and to provide power uh, for the seismograph. But with this new technology that of being able to run seismographs even on very cold temperatures uh, without any people around autonomously, um, we've been able to now essentially cover uh, most or a large part of Antarctica with seismographs. We're basically covering the part of Antarctica where we can easily reach, uh, that we can reach uh, really with the U.S. Antarctic program. Uh, operating out of uh, the bases where, where we have uh, uh, U.S. Uh, resources. So uh, using that, we've been able to make you know, tremendous progress now in understanding uh, what is beneath the ice uh, in this area. Okay, well then, um, looking at what are the major scientific questions here, the first one I'm going to talk about is weighing the ice sheets. Um, and uh, weighing the ice sheets is important because if the ice is melting, then the weight of the ice sheet is changing. And if we can monitor this change in the mass or the weight of the ice sheet, uh, then we can tell what's going on with the Antarctic, uh, with the Antarctic ice sheet. And so um, a couple of things that, uh, that I should mention here. One is a really important satellite called GRACE satellite. It stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Um, interesting acronym. But it basically consists of two very small satellites that follow each other around the Earth. Okay, right? As they orbit around the Earth, they follow each other. And if you imagine that part of the Earth has slightly larger, more gravity than another part, as, that, as one of the satellites approaches that, it's going to accelerate a little bit differently, okay, because the gravity is pulling on it differently than the other one. And so there's an extremely uh, sensitive laser ranging system between the two satellites um, that determines their uh, relative location, you know, at a, at a sub-millimeter accuracy, okay? So they know exactly how far apart those two satellites are. And so therefore, when one of them gets accelerated by this anomalous gravity on the Earth's surface, uh, they, that can be measured. And it turns out that this is an extremely sensitive system for measuring changes uh, in the Earth's gravity. So. We can, they can measure all sorts of really amazing things uh, that are changing in the Earth's gravity related to things happening on the Earth's surface. For example, recently the Gray, the gray satellite has measured uh, a loss of mass uh, throughout California, particularly in the Central Valley. And the reason for that is that basically they have a drought. Uh, and so the water table there is being lowered, and so there's less water in California and so there's less gravity in California, and that can all be measured by, uh, by this kind of satellite. Um, well, anyhow, why we're interested in this is because it can, it's a very, very accurate measure of the changes of mass uh, beneath ice sheets. Um, the other key thing to think about here is when we have the ice sheet uh, and when it, it either builds up or it melts. So say we started out without this ice sheet and then we and then we added the ice. Well, then the, the land moves downward beneath that. And so we want to measure uh, the, these kind of changes. And this slide explains what we call glacial ice static adjustment uh, better. So we imagine, first of all, that we add this ice to the land, okay, and that pushes down on the land. And it turns out, of course, that the land subsides due to the weight uh, of the ice sheet, okay. Um, and part of that response will be immediate. So as soon as you add the ice, then the land will go down, okay? But part of it happens much more slowly. And the reason it happens more slowly is that because the Earth's mantle 
uh, which is more, uh, which flows more easily than the surface area, uh, the Earth's mantle will flow away from this area when the ice is added. But that may take thousands of years uh, for the mantle to flow away. So there's both an immediate response to the change to the adding of the ice mass and a much longer term response due to the flowing uh, of the Earth's mantle. Okay, and then if we remove the ice mass, of course, then there's an immediate response again upward this time, um, which we call the elastic response. And then there's this much more slow response, uh, which is the uh, which is the the from the mantle flowing back in. Okay, and um, this is important because uh, first of all we can look at changes of ice mass by measuring the up and down motion of the land. Uh, using uh, GPS, just like the GPS technology uh, on, you know, that you use when you go hiking um, or with your car, uh, only uh, more accurate. Um, but also because uh, if there's mass changes due to this post-glacial rebound uh, or this glacial isostatic adjustment, that will bias the results from the GRACE satellite. So we need to, to, in order to use the GRACE satellite measurements of, of weighing the ice sheet, we also have to know uh, how the, the solid Earth is responding to changes in the ice mass. Okay, so because of that, we've, um, in addition to putting in seismic stations, uh, we have this a project called PoleNet where we also put in GPS receivers. Um, and so, uh, and this is an example of GPS receivers on, uh, on a nunatak, which is an area where the, uh, the rock sticks out uh, of the ice sheet uh, in Antarctica. And so at these places, we measure both seismic data, or obtain both seismic data and GPS uh, data. Um, and so uh, from that combined study, um, this, from the seismic data, we get a good idea of what the mantle looks like. Uh, beneath Antarctica and what its viscosity is. Because of how fast that response happens, um, if, you look, if we look back at this uh, glacial isostatic adjustment uh, uh, illustration, how fast the land responds here depends on how fast the mantle flows, which will depend on the viscosity of the mantle, okay, and the temperature of the mantle. If the temperature of the mantle is hot, then it's going to flow much more quickly. Um, and if the temperature of the mantle is cold, it's going to flow much more slowly, just like if you have, say, honey or molasses or something like that, and you heat it up, okay, it's going to flow much more easily. It's the same idea with the Earth's mantle. Okay? Um, and so from, in this case, from seismology, we have a picture, essentially, of what the viscosity of the mantle looks like in Antarctica. And we can see that in East Antarctica, uh, we have a very uh, colder mantle, and I've shown that with this blue color here, um, and that indicates uh, that the mantle would, slow, would flow much more slowly uh, in that area. And in West Antarctica, we have this uh, much hotter mantle uh, because the seismic velocities are lower, so then we estimate a much, um, uh, a much uh, uh, lower viscosity uh, in this area. And so we think in this area, the mantle will flow much more fast, uh, much faster. Um, so we think the response time of the mantle to changes in ice weight uh, is about, uh, in East Antarctica, is about uh, maybe 10,000 or 20,000 years, um, whereas in West Antarctica, it's probably something like 100 to 500 years. The other thing you see on this figure are these arrows that are pointing up. That's the vertical motion that we measured from GPS um, in West Antarctica. And they're all going up because, uh, we think, be largely because of ice mass loss. Okay? Um, but in most areas, they're not going up very fast. Uh, but in this particular area along the coast, we have extremely rapid up upward motion, something like two inches per year. And we believe that that's correlated with very rapid losses of ice mass uh, in that area. And because the mantle viscosity is so low, uh, that loss of ice mass must be happening uh, very recently. Um, and this is confirmed uh, pretty much by the GRACE satellite analysis. So this is a map of Antarctica 
showing uh, areas where mass has been lost, shown by red, and where mass has been gained, shown by blue. Um, and you can see this big red bullseye over what we call the Amundsen Sea Coast here, uh, which is this area of West Antarctica where we think uh, there's a big loss uh, of ice. Um, and uh, when we plot this out from the year when um, GRACE satellite was first, um, was first went into operation about 2003 till the present, it looks like there's an accelerating rate uh, of ice mass loss uh, across Antarctica. Okay, so now going on to part two, uh, which is uh, thinking about um, the volcanic and tectonic effects on heat flow. So um, first of all, heat flow is important for the ice uh, because if there were no heat flow from the Earth and you had, like, say, a, a big ice sheet a uh, mile thick, like we have in Antarctica, the bottom of that ice sheet would be frozen onto the rock, okay? And so it wouldn't want to move. It would be very difficult to move that, that along the base of, of the ice sheet. But we do have heat flow from the Earth's interior, um, and that heat flow from the Earth's interior raises the temperature at the base of the ice sheet. In many areas, it can raise it enough that the, that the ice actually melts, and we have things like lakes uh, and water at the base of the ice. And that causes the ice to move quicker, okay? And as the ice moves quicker, then that can actually cause the ice to flow fast to the oceans uh, and melt faster. So that's a key part of this overall system. Um, but we really don't know how to, very well how to estimate this, this heat flow. But our studies in, in West Antarctica suggest that there are parts of West Antarctica where we have uh, high heat flow uh, inside the Earth. Um, and one, one uh, basis for that is this, uh, this um, image that we get of seismic velocities across West Antarctica. And in this image, the red colors denote slow seismic velocities, and the blue colors denote fast seismic velocities. So you can see that there's an area here beneath the Marie Birdland Dome uh, where we have uh, red color meaning very slow seismic velocities, um, which would correspond to high temperatures uh, in the mantle. So it does seem like there's areas of West Antarctica that have, uh, that have uh, high temperatures, and then perhaps, uh, well, it, then that would lead to high heat flow uh, into the base of the ice sheet. Um, another evidence for this high heat flow into the base of the ice sheet is um, volcanoes. And uh, at the very beginning of the talk, well, I think, let's see, a couple, this, uh, here I show you a, a photo of the highest volcano in Antarctica. This is Mount Sidley uh, volcano, uh, which was active about uh, four million years ago uh, and sticks out of the ice sheet so that we can see it. Um, but the question is, do we also have volcanoes that are currently active today, unlike Mount Sidley, which we think has been inactive for the last four million years, and do we have volcanoes that are buried beneath the ice? Because we, we, you know, we don't know in most cases what's beneath the ice sheet. Um, and we did find certainly at least one volcano that's active beneath the ice sheet using our seismographs. So this is a map of, of West Antarctica with the the triangles indicating the locations of our, of our seismographs. Uh, in that uh, boxed region there, we've, we recorded something like 1,300 very, very small earthquakes. Um, and because of the type of earthquakes that they are, um, we could tell that they were volcanic earthquakes. It's a particular kind of earthquake called a deep, long period earthquake. Um, and it is found beneath some of the Cascade volcanoes uh, it's found beneath the Aleutian volcanoes. Um, and we think it, it results from mo motion of magma deep in the Earth. So they tend to be relatively deep, like about 15, 15 miles deep uh, in the Earth. And so after we found all these, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, micro-earthquakes, then we looked at uh, what little data there was on the topography of the land beneath the volcanoes, or beneath the ice sheet. Uh, which comes from uh, this comes from radar uh, 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 data, 
And indeed, in this area, there's a kind of a line uh, of uh, uh, mountains on the, uh, on the earth beneath the ice going out from that volcano that sticks out above the ice sheet um, and then follow, extending under the ice uh, for, uh, for about 50 miles. So uh, we, we did discover then this um, active uh, magma system beneath the ice sheet. So that started us thinking, like, what would happen um, if that volcano did erupt in the future? Another thing that we, that we, were, we found was um, we talked to some uh, scientists at University of Texas that fly radar uh, airplane flights over this area. Uh, and in, in analyzing their data, uh, they found um, layers of ash uh, that were in the ice sheet um, that resulted from volcanoes. Although we're not sure if they resulted from this particular volcano, they may have resulted from another volcano uh, in that very close vicinity. Um, and so then we started to think what, what would happen if this volcano actually erupted beneath the ice sheet. And so we made a very simple calculation about the thermal energy that's required to melt the ice. So we have the heat of fusion of the ice times the density times the volume of the ice. And then we have to think about, you know, you might melt a certain uh, a width or a certain uh, uh, diameter of a conduit uh, above the volcano, um, and you have to melt through a whole kilometer or almost a mile uh, of of ice uh, in order to melt uh, all the way to the surface. Um, and so from that, we got an estimate of six times ten to the fifteenth kilojoules for the amount of energy, uh, uh, thermal energy that would be required to melt all the ice, you know, on top of this volcano uh, if it were to erupt. Um, and then we can compare that to some uh, of the uh, estimated thermal energies of some of the larger eruptions uh, that are known from history. So, uh, for example, Mount Tambora in Indonesia is the very largest known uh, volcanic eruption any time in recorded history. Um, and that one had 8 times 10 to the 16th kilojoules, so a lot more. So if we had a, a really huge eruption, uh, in Antarctica, it would melt the ice sheet uh, you know, above that volcano entirely, uh, and then the ash would, would be um, you know, spread out over the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, but Mount St. Helens, despite how, uh, how destructive it was, uh, was actually not that uh, amazing in terms of its thermal energy. Um, and so its thermal energy was 5 times 10 to the 13th. So, uh, you can see that's quite a lot less than would be required to, uh, to uh, melt the ice on top of this volcano in Antarctica. So, so if Mount St. Helens were to, a type volcano was, were to erupt underneath the Antarctic ice sheet, it probably wouldn't even make it to the surface. Okay? The, all the thermal energy would be used up in just melting the water uh, above, the, uh, uh, you know, above the ice, but not all the way to the surface. Um, so, and then <laughs> it was kind of funny to see what the result was uh, of this. So our university uh, put out a, a, a news release uh, about this, and my graduate student who did this work, uh, Amanda, uh, talked to the news media, uh, and the news media really took off. And so by the time the story got over to Russia, it said Antarctic volcanoes may destroy the ice continent. Um, <laughs> But um, so that's one result of this is uh, hysterical media coverage. Um, but this is just some some illustrations showing, you know, what might happen if you had a tremendously large eruption, then it would break to the surface, um, you know, in a feature su something like this. Um, if uh, if it was a smaller eruption, it would simply uh, uh, melt a large water pocket uh, in the ice, and then the water would drain off. You know, under the ice sheet uh, to the oceans. Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, is essentially using seismographs to, to study how the ice moves and to try to help us understand the physics of how the ice moves. So, um, first of all, we should look at this figure over here, uh, which is um, you, uh, base, it shows the velocity of the uh, ice. Uh, 
uh, over all of Antarctica uh, based on something uh, called radar interferometry. Um, and the blue areas and the purple areas are where the ice is moving really rapidly. Uh, and in the green areas and, and uh, th these kind of areas in the middle here are where the ice is moving very, very slowly. Um, and you can see that over much of Antarctica, the ice moves very, very slowly, but then you have these sort of rivers of ice. Okay? And these are called ice streams. Uh, and they transport the ice you know, rapidly in terms of how ice moves away from the middle of Antarctica to the edge. And that's really important because it's only when the ice gets to the edge that it actually melts. Okay? In the middle of Antarctica, believe me, I've been there. There's no ice melting in the middle of Antarctica. Even in the middle of summer, you know, the temperature is minus 30 degrees, and there's nothing melting at all. So um, it's only at the edges that the ice melts. And so basically how rapidly these ice streams move the ice is crucially important. But we don't really understand the physics of that. And so one of the things that we're doing to try to understand that is studying this ice stream, the Willens Ice Stream, um, which uh, is about, uh, it's maybe about 50 miles wide and several hundred miles long. Uh, and it's just a river of ice, uh, and it moves about three feet per day, okay, uh, as it moves along. Um, and uh, what we found is that this ice stream uh, at its, near its terminus um, actually stops and just stays in one position for about 12 hours uh, and then it suddenly moves forward about two feet okay, over a period of like five or ten minutes and then it just stays there in that position again and then it moves forward again over a period you know, of about five or ten minutes. And so uh, when we put a GPS receiver uh, on top of that ice stream, this is about eight days along the bottom here, um, and this is, uh, this is position. Uh, you see that for a half a day it stays in one place, and it jumps forward, stays in one place, jumps forward. So essentially it's sort of like having earthquake type motions. And we think the physics of this motion is actually very much related to the physics of how earthquakes uh, slip. Um, and every time it moves forward, then we see seismic waves uh, that are given off. Uh, these, this, is a, one of these, this is a seismograph from near McMurdo, which is a U.S. base, and this is a seismograph, uh, seismogram from the South Pole. Um, and those are hundreds of, uh, hundreds of miles away. So by being hundreds of miles away with seismographs, we can still record this, this ice stream moving. Um, and there's even more uh, unusual things about this. It seems like the motion of that ice stream is triggered by the tides. So this is a plot of the tidal motion of the Ross ice shelf. So the ice stream comes into the Ross ice shelf, and the Ross ice shelf is moving up and down all the time. And when the Ross ice shelf reaches its maximum height, then the ice stream and starts to fall, then the ice stream will slip. And then it will slip again when the, when the Ross ice shelf is at its, uh, is, is at its um, minimum. Um, and so it looks like uh, basically the tides are mechanically triggering the slip uh, of the ice stream. And so I'm just going to show a plot yet to show how this happens. So this is, a, this is a map of the ice stream. The ice stream is moving from the upper left to the lower right. And uh, this is the boundary of the ice stream over here, okay? Um, and we had GPS receivers and seismograms all over, seismographs all over this ice stream. And so we can contour up the motion of this ice stream and compare it to the seismogram that was recorded about 500 miles away uh, at the South Pole. Um, and I'll just show the movie. And so what you'll see here is the colors represent contours of slip. So it's starting to slip in that place there on the map. Okay. And over here you see the time. And so that slip, it takes about four minutes for that energy to make it to South Pole, and that slip gave it that pulse. And then there'll be another pulse down here, 
that with a four minute delay will then give it give you this these waves out here. So there's certain areas of this ice stream um, that are actually radiating these uh, seismic waves that we record uh, hundreds of miles away. Um, incidentally, that bar there is 50 kilometers, which is about 30 miles. So this is plotting you know, motions over an area that's you know, like a substantial part of the size of Oregon. Um, so um, basically, what I'm trying to say here is that there's, uh, there's uh, a lot that we don't understand about the physics of these kind of ice streams, uh, but by p installing GPS uh, receivers and seismographs uh, in an area like this, we can see how, how basically the forcing of the Ross ice shelf moving up and down is causing this ice stream to slip uh, and controlling the rate of motion uh, of this ice stream. And we think that the reason this ice stream is showing this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon is because the, the, the velocity of that ice stream is actually changing. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's my presentation. And I think we're probably ready for some, for some questions. <laughs>